Well, good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Great. Oh, we got goods. We got greats. I'm okay. I like that. Well, if you haven't noticed, uh, I am not Pastor Robbie Ashlock. I'm not quite as handsome as he is. Uh, but uh, Pastor Robbie's out on his mission trip to Nicaragua, and they're supposed to come back tonight. He actually texted me last night a video of them inside a volcano. And I was like, are you really inside a freaking volcano right now? He goes, yeah, it's kind of weird. And I was like, well, yeah, considering that thing can just blow up like that. Yeah, for real. But as far as I know, he's fine. So, but, <laughs> but uh, my name is uh, Zach Barnes. I am the student pastor uh, here at Family Life. I have the incredible pleasure of working with your sixth graders through 12th graders, uh, our teenagers, which we all love so much, even when we want to punch them in the face. I love them so much, though. I don't, I don't ever want to punch them in the face. Most of the time. But we have a great time over in Family Life Students. Uh, I enjoy working with them, and uh, it really is one of the, it's literally the, the dumbest job ever because it's so freaking cool. I and mean, the fact that I get to do it as a job is incredible. Uh, we're excited about D-Now coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, I'd be, whatever word I'm trying to find. Uh, we do still need some volunteers for that, pr- primarily guys. Uh, right now we've only got two, including myself. Uh, if we haven't told you before, adults are free for D-Now. You don't have to pay to volunteer. So uh, if you're interested in that, come see me. We'll get you set up and all that stuff. But uh, this morning we will be in John chapter 5. We're going to be in John chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 30. In our text today, we'll be looking at an interaction that Jesus has with a man that has been, to some extent, paralyzed or lame for at least 38 years. Then we see this interaction that Jesus has with the Jewish leaders when they find out uh, that this thing has happened. But while we turn there, I want to ask everyone a question, uh, most to get us thinking, as well as just to be like, yes, I'm not alone in this. But how many of you have something that you really, really want? whether it's a goal that you want to accomplish or a thing that you just want, but you're not really willing to do what it takes to get said thing or to accomplish said thing. As some of you may or may not know, I really like hockey. Hockey is, I would almost say it's pretty much my favorite sport at this point, like maybe even more than football. But I'd love to be able to just play hockey in some capacity, not like try and like duke it out with Alex Ovechkin or anything and play with the pros. But at some point, like, I would like to just be able to play hockey. But one, the equipment on its own is just stupid expensive. And I don't, and I have, frankly, I'm not willing to put in the time or the training just to figure out how to play this incredible sport on ice. For y'all, it might not be something as weird like that. But I'm pretty sure a lot of you will probably share that same desire of, hey, I want to lose weight, get healthier, uh, get fit, Uh, or just even just kind of get healthier in some capacity, but also like me, you don't want to put in that extra time in the morning or when you get off work to go work out, or you really don't want to take sodas out of your diet and things of that nature. And so it's just like, eh, we'll just deal with it. Some of you may have the time or that desire to spend more time in good, legitimate uh, study in the Bible. But at least so far, you haven't necessarily been willing to put that extra time in or to give something up entirely or even partially just to create that time for yourself. Or how often do we find ourselves getting annoyed or even just straight up angry when God blesses or does something awesome for somebody that we don't like? Or even that God does the something cool and good, but it's not the way that we wanted it to happen. We're going to see both of these ideas play out uh, in our text this morning. But before we dig in, uh, I do want to pray together. Father, I just thank you so much for this morning. Uh, Father, I just thank you for this incredible blessing and this incredible opportunity that you've given me to, to preach your word and to dig in with what you have for us this morning. But as we do that, Father, will you uh, man, just get rid of my nerves, my anxiety, and just the dumb in me, that you get rid of that and that you work through me and that the only thing that comes out of my mouth is what glorifies you and honors you. Father, we love you. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's pick up in verse 1 of John chapter 5. It says that sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there in Jerusalem, near the sheep gate, uh, was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. 
one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? So Jesus comes to Jerusalem. It's one of their festivals. And around the Sheep Gate is this pool called Bethesda, which is translated to House of Mercy. Now, if you're kind of like me and you love little tidbits of academia, for a long time, uh, people within archaeology and academia uh, fought on this because there wasn't, at least at that point, any physical evidence, historical evidence that this pool actually existed. But guess what? They found it. People always try to say it's, uh, that New Te- Testament documents are uh, unreliable because of this stuff. But then they found that. They found it right next to the modern church of St. Anne. It had the five colonnades or these covered walkways just as it was described here. But this pool both had a fitting as well as an ironic name, House of Mercy. It was fitting giving the des- desperate state of people lying there just hoping that, this, that they would get a miracle, this cure. But frankly, it was primarily ironic because what you'd really find there was just a lot of sick and broken people. This wasn't a place where you really found healed people or people that found that grace of God like in the physical sense that we tend to think of. This way more looked like a, just a nasty hospital Without, like, the, without the doctors, without the sterile environment. Like, it was actually potentially a really unpleasant place to be. But Jesus comes to this place and he learns of this man's condition. Like, and this wasn't like a, someone came to him and was like, hey, this dude has been like, paralyzed for 38 years. This is one of the several moments in the Gospels uh, where Jesus knows and learns through his divine nature about this man's condition. He knows that And in the midst of complete strangers, no one knows who he is yet, but in complete strangers, Jesus asks the man, do you want to get well? For the people watching this, they're wondering who this guy thinks he is, going up to this invalid and asking him, hey, do you want to be well? But what they don't understand is the significantly bigger picture that is really happening here. Yes, on one hand, Jesus is absolutely talking about, hey, do you want to walk again? Do you want that physical healing? But he's also asking him, do you want your soul to be well? We'll expand on that here in a minute. But the physical wellness is completely, entirely secondary to what Jesus is doing here. But like I said, we'll get there in a second. In verse 7, the man replies, he says, Sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. The man wants to be healed. He wants this. He tells Jesus, but he says, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Even when I am here, someone always managed to get into the pool before I can. Some of you might be wondering what it really matters about if this guy can get in first or what the stirring of the water means and all that. See, this pool was fed by a natural underground spring. And whenever enough water was making its way through, it would stir up and it would look like something was messing with it. The water would move. And as we see in pretty much of all of ancient history and ancient human history at that, uh, the people attached it to something supernatural. Uh, this is most likely why later manuscripts of John have some mention of an angel of the Lord stirring up the waters and whoever gets in first is healed of whatever disease they may have. Uh, but we see this detail added like significantly later as far as the manuscripts go, and, the, and uh, this isn't considered real scripture or actual truth. And I, honestly, I would agree with that conclusion. I'll expand a little bit more on that why too. But the man responds to Jesus asking if he wants to be well. Then Jesus does this in verse 8. Then Jesus said to him, Get up! Exclamation point. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Huh? The people watching this happen, like this is just like a stranger walking into a cancer patient's room at a hospital asking, hey, you want to get better? Okay, cool. Go home. That's a really good, easy way to get police calling you and like dragging you out of the hospital, like real fast. People's minds are going nuts and they're like, what is happening? But then verse nine says this, 
At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. How many of you have heard the saying, God helps those who help themselves? This phrase was made popular in the 1700s from one of Benjamin Franklin's editions of the Poor, uh, Poor Richard's Almanac. But the phrase is even older than that. It turns out that the phrase first appeared, at least as far as what we have uh, documents of, is uh, in Aesop's fable, Hercules and the Wagoneer, as well as other Greek dramas. In this story, you know, a man's wagon gets stuck. He appeals to Hercules in hopes that he would help him get his wagon out. Hercules hears the plea, but he laughs at the man. He scoffs, and it says that he, he says, no such luck. Set your shoulder yourself to the wheel. He says, oh, get yourself out. You got yourself there? Get yourself out. In the Greek story, the god scoffs and laughs at the person appealing to him for help. In our our text today, God himself comes to the man in need, helps the man when he didn't even ask in the first place. Something that we have to understand, and like not just like know, but understand in our hearts, is that God solely helps those who can't help themselves. Not that God only helps those that help themselves, but God strictly, solely, only helps those that cannot help themselves. Like this idea of God only helping those that can help themselves is entirely contradictory to what God taught us through the prophets in the Old Testament, through what Jesus teaches us in the Gospels and even further on in the letters from Paul. None of the paralyzed Jesus, uh, the paralyzed people that Jesus healed were able to help themselves. None of the people that were possessed by demons were able to just cast them out themselves. The Hebrew people couldn't help themselves get freed from uh, from Egyptian slavery. And also when they did get out, they could not help themselves when they had their backs pinned against the Red Sea. Like, that was going to be ballgame for them. All God has done is help those who can't help themselves. That's another reason why the whole angel stirring the water thing and first getting in is healed doesn't, doesn't actually check out. It doesn't work because that's entirely contradictory because if that was the case and that actually was true, boy, that place would be heavily guarded and the only people that could actually get in that pool are the rich and the powerful. Like, forget the, the, the forgotten people. Like, that doesn't work either. So we pick back up uh, in verse 9 uh, in that second half. So it's at, it's after he says that uh, it's picked up his mat and walked. It says, the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So that, excuse me, so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up and pick it up and walk? The man who was helped had no, or healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So the Jewish leaders see this man walking with, uh, walking with his mat. Like These people have lived there their entire lives. They've probably known who this guy was and known that he was paralyzed in some capacity, known that he couldn't have walked. You'd think they'd be like, oh, this dude's walking, this is awesome! No, 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 no. No. Instead, they get mad because homie's you know, carrying his mat on Sabbath day, and it's supposed to be a day of rest. So in this case, a.k.a. God did something totally awesome, but because it broke their version of how they practiced Sabbath, a.k.a. it wasn't the way that they said it should happen, it was a bad thing, and they got mad. We're going to get into why the Sabbath part is a big deal in a moment, but I do want to focus on this interaction when Jesus runs into the man later on at the temple. Jesus sees him and says, see, you're well again. Now stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Remember earlier when I said Jesus was asking the man about like way more than just his physical healing? See, another thing to understand about this man that was still, you know, or that was lame and he was not able, he was lame so he wasn't able 
to go and attend temple. He didn't have the ability to just go to church, which was a big deal. At this point, humanity didn't have access to God through the Holy Spirit like we, like we do now, like just yet. That doesn't happen until Jesus ascends to heaven after his death and resurrection. Like they, everything that depended on their interaction with God or anything between them and God had to go through a third party. It had to go through a priest. So Jesus isn't just asking the man if he wants to walk again. He's asking him, do you want your soul to be well too? Which he did. Because not only does he get up and walk, thanks to Jesus, but you know, he responds in faith. He goes to the temple first so that he can catch up on lost time with God. So he can do something that he hadn't even had the ability to go do for almost 40 years. The man, in, uh, the man in Jesus crossed paths again at the temple and gives him this reminder to keep it up. Keep acting on this faith. Keep, uh, stay faithful to God. He says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. What Jesus is not talking about here is karma. Like, I don't particularly believe in karma. I don't think it's a thing. But you ask, well, what can be worse than nearly 40 years of his life being stolen by his physical brokenness, by disease? What can be worse than physically not even being able to ha really have a family to themselves, to not be able to go work and make a living for themselves? Oh, right, eternity in hell. That, that, that'd be a pretty worse place. A place completely separated from God, like not even with the ability of even third party being able to go to God on your behalf. Like it's completely just nothing. Jesus throws niceties and like politeness completely out the door to show this man mercy and love, reminding him, hey, there are way worse things out there in store for you if you practice sin and stay removed from the Father. There are things way worse than that. There is one more thing we need to understand before we dig into how the Jewish leaders respond to this and how Jesus defends himself. But in what we've read so far, Jesus has given this man two commands. One, get up and walk. Two, stop sinning. On his own, both of these things are entirely impossible. Entirely impossible. Like the man's crippled. He can't just get up and walk. The man has sin in his life. It's impossible for man alone to atone for sin. The thing that made this possible is the fact that Jesus commanded it. And this is why. Because if Jesus, if Jesus gives you a command, he equips you to fill, fulfill it. If Jesus gives you a command, he equips you to fill it. The man couldn't walk, but because Jesus said, get up and walk, he equipped the man with the ability to walk. Jesus said, stop sinning. So he gives the man and all of us what we need to fight against sin. Now, it may take a while to master or do this command well. My good friend Jason didn't suddenly just become a master knife crafter when he got, when he got his forge and whatever stuff he needed to make knives. It takes practice and most likely probably being bad at some stuff for a little bit to learn how to use these tools well. But if Jesus commands it, he will equip you to fulfill it. Not he might or he could, he will. So let's dive into this discourse that Jesus has with the Jewish leaders. If we remember from a few moments ago, they see the man walking with his mat. They get mad because it's breaking the Sabbath, putting that in quotes. But he's breaking the Sabbath by you know, just carrying his mat. The Sabbath thing is a big deal. Because one, it, it is something that God commands us to keep holy, to rest. Like it's part of the Ten Commandments that Moses received on Mount Sinai. It is a big deal and something we need to honor today still. But the Jewish leaders had this tendency to add on to God's law. In some cases, it may have been with good intentions, but it still doesn't change the fact that they added to God's law. In the case of the Sabbath, they took what God commanded us to not do customary work on that day, and they just blew it out of proportion. They went so far as to say that if you plucked a gray hair from your head or from your beard, that you broke Sabbath because you had to exert force to pull it. 
Oh, you also broke Sabbath if you had to pick up anything that weighed more than two dried figs. Not like plump, juicy ones, but dried ones. So it's like, oh, there's a raisin on the floor. I should pick that up. Don't you dare! It's breaking the Sabbath. How dare? So, long story short, if you were to ask the priests and the Jewish leaders at the time what it would mean to do the Sabbath properly, their answer would pretty much be, oh, now nah, just be a potato. Do nothing. Just sit there. So that because they were so enamored and obsessed with keeping their version of God's law instead of actually keeping to God's law, they couldn't be happy and rejoice at God's good work. Instead, they got mad because you know, that's not how they thought it should happen. In verses, uh, picking back up in verse 16, it says, So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Like we just said, Jewish leaders are in a mood already because Jesus is breaking the Sabbath. So they begin to persecute him. But Jesus responds with, my father's always working to this day, and so am I. Jesus is straight up telling them that he is equal with God, that he is very much God. His enemies understood that. The demons he encounters with people understood that, and like, they straight up address him as such all the time. When the paralyzed man's uh, friends dig a hole through the roof, hoping Jesus would just heal him, uh, he does so, but he also responds with, your sins are forgiven. When the religious leaders like, said that no one can forgive sins but God, Jesus is like, boom, nailed it exactly, entirely. That's literally the entire point of what just happened. Jesus is boldly claiming his full deity, and their mood uh, is incredibly just getting worse because like it says, they just wanted to kill him all the more. Picking back up in verse 19, it says, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father does, or for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This paragraph is more than just Jesus you know, stating him being equal to God. You know, he tells them that he can only do what he sees the Father doing, that the Father loves him and shows him all he does, that he will show Jesus greater things than a paralyzed man walking again just to show his greatness to others. That just as God raises from the dead and gives life, Jesus also gives that same life. And that all judgment has been entrusted to Jesus so that all may honor Jesus just as the Father. Now don't miss that last bit in verse 23. Jesus says, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Y'all, a key truth for this whole like following Jesus thing to work is that in order to follow Jesus, we must Believe that he is who he says he is. Y'all have probably heard me say this before, but it's crucial. We must believe that he is exactly who he says he is. Not that Jesus was just a cool dude who had, who had good things to say. Not that Jesus was just a man and just a good teacher. Not that he died and stayed dead. But that Jesus is the son of God and that he is God in the flesh. Anything else is just straight up false, and you might as well be worshiping Gandhi or something because the result will be the same. Zach, how can you say that with such confidence? That sounds really like kind of harsh and kind of hateful. Well, just as uh, Jesus said that whoever doesn't honor Jesus as they honor God doesn't honor God. It isn't hateful or cruel when Jesus tells us the frank truth of himself and the frank truth of sin. Jesus isn't being harsh or hateful, telling the man that he had just uh, healed, 
not to sin, otherwise worse, worse may come upon him. Like it's love and it's grace. Now I'm not giving you permission, neither is Jesus giving you permission to just be a jerk face to somebody in the name of Jesus. Like that totally doesn't work and that's not how Jesus showed us to do it. Like what, even whenever Jesus is talking here and in his other places, he's not being a jerk face about it. He's just telling them plainly, but calmly with mercy and grace as well. But here's the thing. The world likes to tell us that there are many ways to heaven or God. It's just you know, up, to find, up to us to find it. Really? So if you're dealing, with, you're dealing with cancer and the doctor comes in and says, hey, we've got a cure for it, but you've got to find it. You, you've got to figure it out. Like That's your journey to do. That's the answer the world is trying to give you for sin. Yes, there is a cure out there. That cure is called Jesus, by the way but you've got to find it on your own. That's what they try and tell you. It's just like, ah, you figure it out yourself. As we've already stated, we cannot help ourselves. It is impossible for us to do it on our own. As badly as Zach Barnes wants to figure out Zach Barnes' stuff for his own, he cannot do it. It doesn't work. So we'll conclude this morning with Jesus saying this in verse 24 uh, through the end. It says, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. He said, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but crossed over from life to death. Jesus is not holding back his punches. He's very clear on the future to come. He's very clear that there will be a day of judgment. And then one way or another, the dead will rise from their graves. They will either receive and they will receive their final judgment. Or as it's even prophesied, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, it says that multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus is clear. Those who have done good or those who have been faithful to him will rise to live. Or those who have done evil or those who have not been faithful to him will rise to be condemned. And then Jesus concludes with, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Jesus is setting the precedent of humanity and its complete dependence on the Father. Where Jesus was fully God, he was also fully man. Not half one, half the other, all the way both. Yes, I know that's weird. Our brains are weird. We're not God, so imagine that. But he is all the way both. One of the things he was doing on earth was showing us the perfect example of how we can be faithful and follow God well. He does this because of his love and because of his grace. Look, Jesus very easily could have seen us, as Paul likes to remind us, his enemies straight up at his enemies. He could have seen us and just left us to our sin and death forever but he didn't. He loves us and he offers his grace through salvation, through belief and faith in him. On Wednesday nights during our message, we have like a couple times where, we, where, where we'll stop. We'll have a discussion over what we just read or talked about. Um, we're not going to just like stop and let you guys like talk about it like we would on a Wednesday night, but I do want to leave you with the one last question to, talk, to take with you, to talk about at lunch, to talk, or talk about when you get home, either way. See, Jesus offers 
his love and his grace. But in order to receive that love and that grace, we have our part to play. We have a responsibility that comes with that offering of love and grace. Jesus offered his love and grace to the man at the pool and again at the temple. But the man still had to respond to that offer. He responded in faith. He said, yes, I am willing to do what it takes to get well. And not just talking about the walking part. He said, I will go to temple. I want my soul to be well. So my question for you is this. Jesus is asking you if you want to be well. Are you going to do the work and respond in faith or are you going to stay on your mat? Are you going to do the work and respond in faith or are you going to stay on your mat? Jesus is asking, do you want to be well? Are you willing to say yes to pick up your mat and walk a faithful life of Christ? Are you willing to put something else down to spend time in God's word? Are you willing to turn the music off in your car and pray over whatever it is that you're going to or what you just came from? Some of y'all might get mad at me because this is, this is directed both at parents and teenagers. Are you willing to miss the opportunity of what's realistically an empty promise for a scholarship in order to have a thriving relationship with Jesus? Or even are you willing to miss the opportunity of the dream job in order to have that thriving relationship uh, relationship with Christ. Look, I'm not telling you that you can't have those things and have a thriving relationship with Jesus. Like, I'm not, because that, that's totally possible. But whether it's through work, whether it's through our kids' sports, if it's driving a wedge between them and Jesus, if it's taking them away from Jesus, is it actually worth it? Are we willing to do what it takes to have that relationship with Jesus and to have our souls be well. Or even the most hard one. Are you willing to deal with the sin in your life to be well? Are you willing to put yourself in an embarrassing and vulnerable place to deal with the sin in your life and to really, really be well? Let's close in prayer together. Father, I thank you again so much for today and uh, for this morning. Father, I know that some of the stuff that we've talked about and uh, just things that we've heard can be kind of hard to digest, hard to swallow. I know some of that's even true for myself. But Father, as we go back into our lives, as we go out through our days and all of this stuff, Father, that we do the things that are what will help our souls be well. Uh, we know we can't do it by ourselves. We know we can't do it on our own. But we know we can do it through you and ultimately that you're the one that does it. May we go to you. May we reach out to you and say, yes, I want to be well. And may we depend on you for the strength to do the things that we need to do in order to be well. Father, thank you so much for Jesus and Thank you that you didn't look upon us and say, nah, uh, that's not worth it. But that you looked at us with love, that you looked at us with grace and said, I want to be able to redeem this. I want, I want my creation to have a relationship with me. I want to repair the destruction in between us and that gap between us. Father, we love you. We praise you. It is in your name we pray.